Good morning, everybody. Welcome back for day two of CivicsCon 2023. Thank you for braving the threat of storms. I was looking out the window and it was not actually wet outside, despite the noise. Um, it'll just be really hot this afternoon. That's what we get. Um, thanks everyone who was here yesterday. I got really great feedback from you and others that were here. Um, it sounds like yesterday was a meaningful time of coming together, of discussing a broad range of diverse ideas, um, of wrestling, I think, with you know, what it means to live in a representative democracy with people that have diverse opinions and beliefs and perspectives on things where needs don't always match up with resources uh, and, and where what is good for one person may not be what's good for a group. Um, and sometimes what's good for the group is not always good for one person. Um, and I think, I don't, but you, but I personally like wrestle with I don't know, how selfishness and democracy interact, right? Like that's a, a, a humbling thing to say out loud, I think, but um, it's easy to like point figures, uh, point fingers at you know politicians who make self-serving decisions. When the truth is, on some level, like we all make self-serving decisions, and when it comes to advocating for specific policies or even having an opinion about how something is supposed to work, um, bespeaks our own kind of bias there. All right, well, that, that took a deeper turn than I expected this morning. <laughs> anyway, try the scones. They're lovely. Um, uh, this morning, we have uh, a couple of really great speakers, several really great speakers. Um, and so I'm going to step aside and invite uh, the first one to come. Our first speaker is Larry O'Dell, who is a native Oklahoman. And currently, he is the uh, state historian at the Oklahoma Historical Society. Um, Larry is, I think, besides me, the only returning speaker to CivicsCon. He spoke last year, um, so this is exciting for me because it does make us look legitimate to speak two years in a row. Um, uh, but it's great. Um, um, I could read Larry's old bio. He is an author of a number of books. He knows more about this state than probably the rest of us put together. Uh, and I know some of you are big history nerds, and so that says a lot. Um, give us just a minute to get stuff set up and give Larry a round of applause. Thank you for uh, having me. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we got to where we are in politics in Oklahoma. And I'm going to go back from the start. First of all, I want to tell you my boss was asked to do this and he's out of town. So he said, I've got a PowerPoint for you. You don't have to worry about it. So these aren't my slides, but I can use them as a guide. So I don't know what he was doing here, but he's kind of giving you the uh, Oklahoma legislature symbol explained. I, so you can take a few minutes to, to uh, look at that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's from Tulsa World, so. All right. So we're going back to the, uh, the Indian removal. There were a few tribes that used Oklahoma as, as either hunting grounds or here, the Caddo's and Wichita, but most of the 39 tribes, federally recognized tribes, were relocated here from, from elsewhere, from other parts of the United States. So, and when you think about the Trail of Tears and the five tribes, the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Seminole, and Creek, and you think of the uh, Trail of Tears, these tribes had already been southernized, if that's the right word to use. So they had slaves. So they made the Trail of Tears, but think about what their slaves had to endure on the Trail of Tears. So th they were given all of Oklahoma except for the Panhandle. Um, during the Civil War, all the five tribes signed treaties with the Confederacy. Not all of them fought with them. Half, use, half the Cherokees fought with the North, half fought with the South. But after the Civil War, the United States used that as an excuse to um, redo their treaties. 1866 treaty. So they took half of Oklahoma away from them, the western half, um, made them accept their former slaves as full tribal members. The Chickasaws fought it, sometimes still fight it, but that's how we had uh, freedmen in the beginning of so many black towns here, here in Oklahoma. Um, but the tribes had their own governments, they had their own laws, they had their own councils, they had their own police force. So. From there until the Dawes, to the, well, 
I, I skipped his, uh, his um, there were many whites that came to Oklahoma legally and illegally in Indian Territory part. Some of them were um, sharecroppers for the tribes. Others just settled and, and were not forced out. So in Western Oklahoma, the bo I know you guys know what boomers are. They, they clamored for more land. And so we had these first of a series of land runs. These opened up non-Indian settlement to the western part of Oklahoma. Um, a lot of African Americans from the south and from Kansas made these land runs, so we had a, a large amount of African Americans in our state. 10%, they, they went and they um, lobbied Washington, D.C. to make Oklahoma territory an all-black territory, but the amount of white folks it just overwhelmed them and it, it didn't happen. So, in the western part of the state, I think this is on a, okay, he goes with the Dawes Commission. So to get this land, they had to allot tribal land into individual allotments to free up more land. And this began in 1887. Originally, the Dawes Commission wasn't going to pertain to the five tribes, but eventually it did. Um, and to get an allotment, you had to be on the rolls. It didn't matter about how much blood you had. It, it's if you were on the rolls at a certain time in the history. So this abolished all the communal land. Um, it did take out the land for towns, for timber, for coal, for um, and other smaller um, things like that. Um, the, so after they did this, there was. We'll talk about politics. In Oklahoma Territory, there was always a political, or always a Republican in office. So politics in Oklahoma was Republican because they were appointed by the president. Um, the Republican, the, the frat, Oklahoma's, people that have settled Oklahoma have always leaned towards populism. Um, and just because they're Republicans didn't mean that they just followed what the national Republicans did. That's why he talks about the free silver movement. That was fractured the party in Oklahoma Territory. Um, the territorial legislature was pretty weak, didn't, didn't complete much. And the corporations, trains, coal mining, that kind of thing, really had a lot of power during the territorial era. So there was a clamor for new states, new state. There were two movements. There was a single state movement for both territories, and there was two separate um, territories. Sequoia Convention was Indian Territory. They wanted, they knew that if, if it was a big state that, that they would lose all the power that they had. So they, they had a convention in Muskogee. And interestingly, the convention was most of the same people that was in Oklahoma's constitution, but there were two African-American delegates to the Sequoia Convention. There were many tribal delegates and some white delegates, so it was a really mix. Um, and a lot of the uh, ideas they had for their convention was used in the later Constitutional Convention. Um, so they passed their, um, they passed their Constitution and it was ratified, but it, it didn't matter. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt had already promised one state for both territories and they didn't have the power to, to undo that. So 1906, the Enabling Act combined the two territories to become one state. So like I said, the Constitutional Convention had a lot of the same people, including Alpha Alpha Bill Murray and, and others, but it did not allow any African Americans in its convention. And Alpha Alpha Bill Murray made several racist speeches during the convention. And, and a lot of the African Americans in Indian Territory knew that though Roosevelt said he would not sign a constitution if it had Jim Crow laws, they knew that as soon as the statehood came that they would pass Jim Crow laws. They sent 11 of their influential members to, to DC who met with Roosevelt, um, but it, it didn't matter. There was gonna be, this was the way it was gonna be and they were gonna pass this, this constitution. Um, and with that, the Republicans lost all power in, in Oklahoma for many years. Um, Democrats overwhelmed them, many populist Democrats. Um, and the Constitution was very labor friendly. It was very union friendly. In fact, the signers of the Constitution gave their pens to Samuel Gompers, who was a, a national um, labor leader. So 
And it was one of the longest constitutions ever written. So it was, a, it was very progressive in, in many ways, and, um, which are changing now. But. So the Shawnee demands were another representative of how union friendly this was. They, a lot of the protections were an eight hour work day, um, protection engine, Indian injured, injuries on the job. And now that's being talked about right now is the uh, initiative referendum and recall. So and compulsory education, prohibition of child labor. These were all really progressive demands at the time period and, and they were put into the constitution. As you can see, uh, these are some of the uh, features. Um, pretty normal, except for the referendum, uh, corporation commission to, to try to keep the corporations from having too much power, Department of Charities and Corrections, even though she couldn't vote, Kate Bernard was, the, the pre was over that, um, had that office. And uh, so the African Americans from Indian Territory were right. The very first bill passed in statehood was Senate Bill 1 which was a Jim Crow law that segregated train cars. So, um, and that just kicked off an era of, of Jim Crow that lasted into the 60s in Oklahoma. Um, there was a lot of banking legislation that was passed. Um, they kept, oh, good grief. Uh, there was a big fight about where Oklahoma's capital would be. There was elections, lawsuits, another election, and then finally it was in Oklahoma City. Um, Guthrie fought hard to, to keep the capital because that's where it was during the territorial era. Um, as transportation increased, they created a highway commission. Um, eventually, in 1918, um, women's suffrage passed and women could vote. So it was. And in 1917, the Socialist Party got 20% of the vote. The Socialists had a very big presence in Oklahoma during this time period. They actually had a, a large presence and influence until World War I and um, the Green Corps Rebellion, which pretty much ended. It was a, a lot of Socialists were going to march from Oklahoma to D.C., um, eat corn, and burn things as they went to protest the war. Um, and that. They were stopped very early on, but that pretty much killed the Socialist Party in Oklahoma. And then the Red Scare helped really um, kill it. And as Jim Crow continued um, in the early 20s, right about the time the Tulsa Race Massacre happened, um, they didn't really officially have a presence until after the, the riot, but they, they gained momentum and ground in Oklahoma very quickly. Um, the Tulsa Race Massacre is in 1921, 35 square blocks just destroyed in Tulsa. Um, Walton was impeached after a year. He was a, some remnants of the Socialist Party and Demo progressive Democrats got together and, and um, got, got lot Walton elected, but he was pretty corrupt and he was impeached within a year. Um, and then Governor Henry, Henry Johnson was elected, and he was just a nut, and um, <laughs> that's basically what he got impeached for, for being a nut. So those were the two impeachments that we had during this, this era. Um, Alpha Alpha Bill Murray returned from South America, where he had gone to try to create a colony and got back into politics and become, became a force and became governor. Him and Marlin both rejected the New Deal. So Oklahoma didn't get much of, um, of assistance during the Depression, during the uh, New De Deal era until later. Um, he, the Highway Patrol was created um, and there was a lot of turmoil, depression. It was a lot of, this is the time of the 
beginning of the Oki migration out of here, which interestingly, mo main, mainly the uh, Okies were from eastern Oklahoma. They were sharecroppers being tra tractored off their land, um, not being able to provide for their families. It wasn't from the Dust Bowl, but, but um, the consolidation of land and, and the, um, not being able to make a living in agriculture. Um, the 40s and 50s is when we start getting uh, Jim Crow, slowly cracking Jim Crow. Um, we get a, we do the balanced budget amendment under Leon Phillips, which says that our budget has to be balanced every year, um, which is sometimes hard to do. Um, we got the World War II in manufacturing military bases like Tinker, Tinker Field and the bomber plant in, in Tulsa. Uh, Ada Louis Cipio Fisher um, integrated OU Law School. Um, she sued them to get a seat, and when they finally tried to seat her, she was put in a chair by herself with the word colored on her chair, and um, you know, and then she ended up being a regent for the University of Oklahoma later in her life. So it's it's a great story. I'm trying to do all of Oklahoma's politics in a short amount of time, so I'm sorry I'm going, <laughs> going so fast. Um, um, also, during uh, this time period is when schools were desegregated. Uh, Raymond Gary did that, and uniquely, Oklahoma is the first southern um, considered state to desegregate their schools. He came from a, a education background and he really believed in, in education and embraced this very quickly after it was passed in Kansas. Um, since, uh, Claire Looper began her OKC sit-in movement in 1958. Um, she took Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, peaceful protest teachings and integrated downtown Oklahoma City in two years before Greensboro happened. She went the next year and um, talked about her results at the NAACP, and the kids from Greensboro were there, and they got her message, and they took it back to North Carolina. So, um, Prohibition was always kind of a joke here in Oklahoma. It was, uh, so um, when, uh, so, get these names right. So, Governor Edmondson had grown tired of it being a joke, and all, so he, he decided to crack down because he wanted it ended. It. So when the police finally cracked down on prohibition, that is when people was like, well, no, let's vote for it. And so that's how we ended prohibition here, here in Oklahoma. It was only, you could only have 3.2 beer. You, we didn't have liquor by the drink, but it was a, a start to ending prohibition here in Oklahoma. Um, and now as we get to the 60s, 70s, and later, I welcome any comments from any of you because you might know some of this more than, than I do, but Lloyd Rader um, was over DHS, and he consolidated a bunch of different agencies to create a large DHS, and he was very powerful. Nationally, he was very powerful. And so when DHS had these new ideas, we try them in Oklahoma first. We were the first state to have um, Mine just went blank. First state to have, uh, where you can use a card to get groceries. Yeah, well, SNAP, but before it was SNAP, what it was called. We were the first state, state to try that. He was very powerful um, in, the, in the national government, and he would, we would get things before any other state because of the power he wielded. Um, so reapportionment. Um, at this time, rural Oklahoma had more power than urban Oklahoma, even though they had less people and it wasn't one vote for one person. So um, there was the court cases. Um, and finally, in the early 60s, they reapportioned it and changed it where it was more equal to the population. So, and then Supreme Court bribery. Um, I want to get these names right too. So, uh, Judge 
N.S. Corn admitted to taking bribes and implicated two other sitting judges, Judge Earl Welch and M.B. Johnson. Um, they all resigned or were impeached, but that was a big scandal in Oklahoma. And then Governor David Hall, who was really a rising star in the Democratic Party at the time, got convicted of bribery and some other things and ended up being the only governor to go to jail. So, So far, that is correct. <laughs> that is correct. And then we had a very large and widespread county commissioner scandal that some of you guys might remember, um, which implicated 150 people were convicted in this county commissioner scandal. It was really widespread and, and kind of in, indicative of uh, Oklahoma's politics at the time. And then in the 70s is when tribal sovereignty returned to the tribes. They, they, um, they got to restart their governments and create the powerful entities that they are now. And this occurred in the 70s with the um, Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act, so 1975. So that started them to the road they're on now with um, the power they wield and, and the ability to, to make their own decisions. 80s and 90s, I was in high school and college, so I don't remember a lot of this part, <laughs> but they ended liquor by the drink. You could, uh, you could finally go sit at a bar and, and get a drink without bringing your own bottle of alcohol and paying someone else to pour it for you. So, and then in uh, HB 1017 was the Education Reform Act of 1990. It was, a lot, it was an important act of legislation that funded a broad range of education initiatives through taxes, trying to get the reduced class sizes, um, get teacher salaries higher, er, early childhood program, education programs, and curriculum standards. So that was very important in 1990, right after I got out of high school so that it didn't affect me. But, and then they created an ethics commission to rein in all the, the political um, politicians and and government agencies from corruption. Um, it, it applied to elected officials, lobbyists, and state employees, and it worked to, to lessen the amount of scandals that we had in our state. And this came about after the county commissioner scandal. Um, they, they House Senate question 640 passed in 1992, which l limited the legislature from raising taxes. Um, Oklahoma Quality Jobs Incentive was created in 1993. Um, employees got rebates from the state for creating jobs with the salary threshold limited to manufacturing, IT distributions, and administrative services. It applied to 5% of new payrolls for up to 10 years. So it was a way to try to, to get more companies here. And then in the 2000s to where we are now, um, I'm sure many of you um, could talk about this better than I could. Uh, 2004, the Republicans took over. Democrats had ruled the state since the early 20s. Um, so they took over. As, and it was a national trend. It wasn't just a state trend. Um, a lot of the southern states, it was the same thing. Um, term limits were voted in, which could be debated whether it was a good or bad thing. There was many good politicians in the Capitol that, that worked hard, um, that we missed their leadership, others not so much, so, but that, that came in. Um, we started giving more power to the governor. The, to, he, started taking, he or she started taking over boards, DHS, tourism, health care authority, the power to appoint people to these boards. Um, we, the DHS Pinnacle Plan occurred in 2012, a federal class action lawsuit challenging the state's treatment of children in foster care. Um, state, the state had to meet terms of, a, of a independent experts who monitored their progress for five years. And it's been, so far it's been extended indefinitely. So 
Um, of course, Trey was who created this, and he was over the capital restoration, so we want to make sure we put that in here. In 2014, we, uh, we began modernizing our state capital. It's finishing up right now, and they're about to have a celebration in the next, this year, I think, for the, the completion of it. Um, we finally modernized our liquor laws, where you can go and buy any type of beer you want. Um, uh, liquor stores can be open later, can be open on Sundays. So we've got a we've got a modern liquor laws like almost every other state. So um, legislature under Mary Fallon had to increase taxes for the first time in many many years, and then of course McGirt versus Oklahoma um, gave more power to the tribes, more sovereignty, and gave them the um, said the, the case said that the Creek no Nation was never disestablished for criminal jurisdiction, returns only to the Major Crimes Act, but has expanded tribal sovereignty in a meaningful way. So I think I went through all of Oklahoma's government pretty quickly, so I, I can talk about any questions. This is, this is Trait's podcast, Very Okay Podcast. He does that with our former director, Bob Blackburn. And he, it's released monthly, so you can hear that on wherever you want to, um, wherever you listen to podcasts. And we are a membership institution, so we encourage you to become an OHS member. So are there any questions or anything you want expanded on or any comments? Yes, ma'am. Can we get copies of the slides? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I can send those to you. Yes, sir. Talk a little bit more about rejecting the New Deal funds in the first part of, I guess, the 30s, maybe? Yeah, yeah. Alpha, Alpha Bill Murray um, became governor, and <laughs> the New Deal was just happening, and he, he rejected it. He states rights, self-determination, all that kind of thing. And he actually had, um, <laughs> he created victory gardens for the Depression, you know, and he, he created gardens at the governor's mansion, but he, he rejected the New Deal. He, he thought that the state could, could do it themselves. <laughs> um, he roundly rejected it too, yeah. So um, we didn't get any help. And then in Marlin tried to pass New Deal le legislation, but the legislature rejected Marlin. So it wasn't until the next governor um, that embraced the New Deal, and, and we got a lot of the uh, WPA projects, you know, all around the state, and the lakes, the um, basketball gyms for schools, new schools, that kind of thing. So yeah, Oklahoma resisted it for two govern governors before we finally accepted it. Yes, ma'am. It was, um, it was two senators for every county, no matter what the population was. Okay. And then when they reapportioned it, they made it more evenly through population, created districts to do that. So um, it's all, in Oklahoma, it's always been a fight between urban and rural politics, going back from, to the very beginning of it. So still goes on today with urban try, or rural legislature trying to hang on to any control that they can have. So, any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, well, one comment yeah. uh, about the slides, yes. If, like, we're recording all these sessions, and so I'll put them together, but we'll send them all out if we can get them. Um, secondly, Larry, as a state historian, what's your favorite interesting fact about Oklahoma political history? Oh, man. I, I think it's very interesting to me, and in the in the late teens, the the social socialist movement that was going on in Oklahoma. I mean, it was it wasn't just a bunch of quacks out on the edges. It was really respected folks that were running as socialists in this state, and they were getting elected in many areas. Um, one thing that I'm working on right now is in 1917, as Jim Crow was just 
you know, law after law was being passed. There were leaders, African American leaders, that were fighting against that. And they had a large convention, and they turned from both Democrats and Republicans. Uh, African Americans had been Republicans for years, the party of Lincoln, um, because Republicans were voting for these laws too. So they turned to the Socialist Party. So many African American leaders in the late teens joined the Socialist Party because they saw that as their only way of being rep represented in the state. Along those lines, just a, a comment, not a question. Yes, sir. I find it interesting that such a pro-labor, traditionally pro-labor state has now come around to be such an anti-union labor state. Yes. Uh, that is interesting that there's that history there, that long history. Yeah, and I, I think I talked about this last year. It's, it's interesting that they had these values, but they also had these very religious values. And it seems like the religious values overwhelmed their political values eventually down the line. Is there any, anything else? All right. Well, that didn't take as long as I thought. 